Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Welcome, my name is Dr. Shelley smith Dacheco. I am going to talk to you today about genital lymphedema, the basics everyone should know. I would like to take this time to thank LEARN for providing me with this opportunity to talk about this very important topic. I've been a pelvic floor physical therapist for almost 23 years and a certified lymphedema therapist for almost 22 years. So you can say because of these two specialties, genital lymphedema has, has kind of fallen into my lap. Um, I do specialize it in, in my practice and with a lot of my education. So I'm going to try to tell you as much as I can about genital lymphedema in the next hour. There will be time at the end for questions and answers. So if you will please use the Q&A box on your uh, bar at the bottom to enter any questions you have during the presentation. I will try to answer all of them at the end. As with any presentation, this is not to supersede any healthcare advice given to you by your provider, so please speak with them if you have any personal health concerns. Here are my disclosures. I am a Casley Smith International Lymphedema Instructor. I own the educational company LymphEd. I am an assistant professor at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine in the Physical Therapy Department in Atlanta, Georgia, and I still treat at the Sports Rehab Center in Atlanta. This is a presentation on a very sensitive topic, genital lymphedema, so some of the content may not be appropriate for everyone, so please use discretion when viewing. And again, this does not, is not meant to provide medical advice for individual patients, so please talk with your medical team or physicians. So what are we going to cover? So I'm going to try to go through anatomy, kind of the general aspects of genital lymphedema, what's the prevalence and causes of it, what are some key evaluation things we need to look at? And what is some of the basic treatment options for genital lymphedema? So first, the anatomy. I always start with the bony structures. And the reason why is because often when someone has genital involvement, there can be some distortion in the anatomy or the shape of the individual due to either the surgeries, radiation, changes in the body structure due to the swelling and abnormal tissue that lays down. And so if you know your bony structures, you can always figure out kind of where you are, what structures are attached there, what organs and other structures are in the vicinity. And so it's kind of your lighthouse to kind of guide you where you are when it's not presenting as a regular normal body that you studied in medical school or have seen on charts. So I've highlighted with stars some of the key bony landmarks. So you have your iliac crest, your ASIS, which is your anterior superior iliac spine, and your PSIS, which is the posterior, your pubic symphysis, pubic bone, and ischial tuberosity. Your pelvis bones that we just went over have over 46 muscles that attach to them. That is over double what your shoulder and knee have. The reason, again, the muscles are important is because often with genital lymphedema, the patient has either undergone some trauma that has interrupted or inhibited these muscles, or the swelling and symptoms related to the genital lymphedema has impacted them. With lymphedema of any region, we always want to use a muscle pump to kind of help move the fluid out of the region. And so by knowing the muscles in the area that should be involved in your treatment and contractions to help move that fluid helps. And then also assessing them to see, is there a dysfunction with one of them that could actually be hindering the progress for the patient. Some of the other muscles that are usually less familiar that attach to the pelvis are gonna be your pelvic floor muscles. Part of these are your coccygeus muscle, your levator ani, which is what makes up the hammock at the bottom of the pelvis and is the one most people are familiar with. It is made up of four different muscles. And your perineal muscles, which is what helps give shape to the external genitalia for both the males and the females. And again, you can see the bony landmarks and how the muscles are attaching at those bony landmarks. 
You also have to consider we have organs. This is a very condensed area. There's not a lot of space for extra fluid or other things in the area because everything's so packed in. For the females, you have your uterus, you have your bladder, your rectum. And obviously I did not draw these pictures because next will be the males. Otherwise you would not understand what they were. But often when the images are drawn of anatomy, the pelvic floor muscles are not drawn to scale of how really they impact this area. So you can see at the bottom, there are arrows pointing to your pelvic floor muscles, but actually they're much more are significant and take up more space and are more vital than it appears in this picture to help with support of the structures, but also moving fluid out. And then here's the male model and you can see the prostate, which is usually the one that is most often involved when we're having pelvic issues for males is this has been removed and then what fills the space and helps take care of those aspects. And again, you can see the pelvic floor muscles are fairly small in this drawing. Another aspect is lymphatomes that just like if you were to go to a event at an arena, whether it's a sports or a concert, the arena has special doors that depending on where your ticket is, they want you to come in and out of. And this is to try to help control the flow in and out of the arena for safety and time management. So your body has kind of done the same thing. They've divided your body up into sections or lymphatomes or lymphosomes, depending on uh, your training to kind of help guide where all the vessels in that region go roughly the same direction into the same drainage area. So when you're looking at the genital or lower trunk region, you have your inferior trunk on the front and back, you have your lateral thigh, you have your anterior leg, and you have your medial thigh. We'll go back through these some when we talk about the manual lymphatic drainage and how you use these different lymphatomes to help move the fluid out. And by adding in the bony prominences again, it can help the clinician and the patient realize where are these lymphatomes really starting and stopping based off of muscles and bony landmarks when the body is slightly distorted for different reasons. Taking a closer look at the pelvis and the lymphatics is here you're seeing kind of a, a hemipelvis or split vision of the pelvis with those pelvic floor muscles and the bony uh, prominence is marked. If I bring up one that shows the lymphatics, you can see your pelvic floor muscles and you can see your different lymphatic vessels and nodes. You can see how they're all right at each other. So by contracting these muscles, you're going to create that muscle pump onto those nodes and vessels to help move the fluid out of the region. The next two slides are of cadaver pictures. I do ask that you do not screenshot or use these pictures for other reasons that cadavers do have more rights than live humans to protect their personal pictures and identities. So here is a cadaver and you can see with the little tags, the different sets of lymph nodes. So it's harder to see the superficial because they're here in a clear tag than your deep inguinal your red is an external iliac, your sacral nodes, your common iliac, your internal iliac are a little hard on a picture because they're brown, and then your lumbar is in blue. When we take this pelvis and we split it into a hemipelvis or open it up like the drawing was earlier, again, you can see the different lymph nodes. And if I superimpose the muscles, you can see how the muscles are right there with the nodes. Now, unfortunately, lymphatic vessels, besides the thoracic duct, you cannot see with the naked eye. So I can't show those in the networks with them, but you can see by incorporating pelvic floor muscles, you're going to get some movement of the lymphatics through the pelvis. Another key with the lymphatic nodes is if you look at this, it's a little congested, I know, it shows which regions of the genitals for both males and females are drained by which nodes. Most all of your regions, especially the more vital ones like your uterus and your testes, are drained by multiple sets of nodes. So this provides a safety mechanism. So if you have your inguinal nodes removed, your iliac nodes could help remove the fluid from the regions that the deep or superficial inguinal nodes would have used to help move things out. 
Now, obviously, if the common iliac or the higher nodes are involved, there's going to be much more substantial damage or symptoms for this patient because you've blocked most of the pathways that could possibly come out. So if you look at old textbooks and look at the function of the pelvic floor muscles, you will see these four are listed, that it supports and kind of holds up all of your organs in the ca pelvic cavity. It helps with your sphincter control for bowel and bladder. It aids in sexual function for both males and females, and it aids in childbirth for females. If you look at more recent texts, especially ones written by therapists that also work in lymphedema, you will see we've added a new one where it drains the lymphatics of the genitals and the pelvis. So going on to kind of more of a general genital lymphedema, what's the prevalence and what are signs and symptoms? The main problem with genital lymphedema is the studies are all over the place on numbers. You can see where anywhere between five to almost 80% of individuals with leg involvement also have genital involvement. Anywhere from 20 to 80% that have had lymph nodes removed in the pelvic region for cancer will have genital lymphedema. For males, it can involve the scrotum and or the penis. And depending on the study, again, one to 30% almost of prostate cancers will have lymphedema and of those 22% will have genital involvement. For females, it's a little harder sometimes to notice because it can be internal and or external structures. So it can be in the vagina and never go into the labias, or it can be there for an extended period of time before it hits the labias. So that's why this also has kind of a range of seven to almost 50% of gynecological cancers lead to lymphedema with or without genital involvement. And almost 100% of patients with vulvar or vaginal cancers will end up with lymphedema and or with genital involvement. Why are we not diagnosing this better? Why do we not have better stats? Genital region in general has been a taboo for most of us. We were taught as a young child, you don't talk about your genitals in public. So it carries over into adulthood that the physicians may not feel comfortable asking the patient about this and the patient may not feel comfortable giving the information to the physician without being asked. And then also with the therapist, is the therapist asking the patient and is the patient telling the therapist things? It's very rare to see it mentioned in books. It's usually a sentence or two. You're lucky if it's a paragraph or more, and it's very rare to be included in studies. What are some causes? Primary is one of the main ones. It's where the person is born with a dysfunction in the lymphatic system. This dysfunction may be present where you can see signs and symptoms at birth, or it may come on sometime later in the child or person's development. Secondary lymphedema means the person was born with a normal lymphatic system, but something has damaged it through their life, whether it was lymph nodes being removed, radiation, tumors in the region, chronic infections or inflammation, especially filariasis, that's still one of the main reasons for lymphedema worldwide, traumas, including surgeries for other non-cancer re reasons, a history of lower extremity lymphedema, some of your GI um, type conditions, yeah. Crohn's, lymphomas, hepatitis, immobility, because if you're sitting all the time, your abdomen's putting pressure on your inguinal nodes and making them in where they can't work. And we're seeing a huge increase in obesity-related lymphedema, and especially genitals, that obesity has fat tissue or adipose tissue, I prefer to call it. Adipose tissue causes swelling. Swelling causes adipose tissue to be laid down, the abnormal brown fat type of tissue. And so it keeps feeding itself. And then obviously with obesity, if the person has a large abdomen, it's going to provide more pressure onto the inguinal region, again, preventing that region from draining well. So what are some signs and symptoms? The patient often is going to complain of pain, pressure, or heavy sensation in the genital region, or for like females in the vaginal area. There could be some bowel and bladder dysfunction, either from the lymphedema or from what caused the lymphedema, the different surgeries. Sometimes patients, actually their 
bladder continence, their ability to hold urine is pretty good when they're swollen. And then as the swelling reduces, they actually end up with more incontinence because the fluid was supporting the bladder. Bacterial infections, you can have skin changes. Papillomas are kind of like wart-like looking or cyst-like growths that you will see. Open sores, dry and flaky skin. They may complain of a dragging or bursting feeling in the genital region. They can have pain with urination. There can be sexual dysfunction for both males and females. They may not be able to achieve excitation for intimacy. They may have pain with intimacy. Their libido may go down. Um, because of the region of the genitals being between the legs, it often can impact a person's ability to participate in activities of daily living and for walking. It's hard sometimes to find clothing to cover the area if it's increased to a size that would not be easily covered in pants. It can provide emotional, functional disability type components, depression, anxiety, self-esteem, it can interfere with relationships with others, especially intimately. So you can see with all these signs and symptoms that patients with genital involvement can truly have a reduced activities of daily living and quality of life based on this condition. So how do we diagnose it? Your healthcare provider should do a regular evaluation that they're going to do for a patient with lymphedema but they need to add in some other components. When you're talking with a the patient, they need to ask questions about the bowel and bladder. Do you leak urine or bowel? How often are you going a day? Do you have pain or discomfort when you go? Are you able to hold it when you have symptoms? Ask about sexual abilities. Are you able to achieve an erection or excitement? Are you able to physically participate in intimacy? Do you have discomfort? Do you have discomfort afterwards? What happens with the swelling afterwards? What's your history with infections? What have you done to treat those infections? What are some other symptoms like we went over with the bursting pain, the dragging, the pressure? asking them about those. A lot of times patients don't realize a pressure sensation in the vagina is not normal after procedures and can tell the therapist or the physician that you actually have fluid or something else going on in the region. What's the psychological impact? In the United States, we do have to, for insurances, provide a quality of life tool to help kind of grasp this component of how is this affecting the patient with their ADLs or psychologically. But we need to assess this. And sometimes the tools that are out there don't really cover this well for genitals. With the objective component, which is what you see, feel, and can measure, the big thing I have to always kind of stress is the healthcare professional has to see it. You can't always take a patient's word for it because the patients, unless sometimes they work for Cirque du Soleil, they can't always see what's going on down there or they haven't wanted to see what's going on down there. So it has to be looked at. What do we see? Are we seeing swelling in this part, not in that part? What's the condition of the skin? Is there leakage or discharge anywhere? Is the skin healthy? Does it have sores? Is it dry? Is it flaky? What's going on with it? Are there the papillomas or lymph cyst or other abnormal growths onto the genital region? Um, is there indentations from clothing? We don't like to buy larger clothing, especially for bras and underwear. Um, so sometimes when we gain weight or because it's from fluid, we don't go to larger sizes and you can see indentions from the underwear or pants on the trunk. Is it symmetrical? Is one side more swollen or is it more um, involved in skin changes? What's going on with each side? And panis refers to the abdomen. Is there a larger abdomen? Is that abdomen hanging down over the thighs? If so, how far down is it going and what does it feel like? Is it soft? Is it hard? We need to actually touch the areas with gloves on that is their pitting, which is where your healthcare professional pushes usually the thumb in gently into the skin and holds for about 20 seconds, lifts up and sees, does your skin immediately bounce back? Or can you see the mark of my thumb in the skin? So we can do that to all aspects of the genital region. 
we can check for fibrosis. Is the tissue under my hand, is it hard? Is it adipose tissue? How does the skin move? Remember your genitals are used to being very elastic and changing with uh, different functions with intimacy or healing after surgery. So the skin there's more mobile than most your other skin. So what is the mobility? Can the body adjust like it's supposed to with everyone's actions? A stimmer sign can actually be done on any part of the body. Most people only consider it with the toes or the fingers. But what a stimmer sign is, is where you grab a piece of the tissue and try to pull up. And it's where you're trying to separate the different layers of tissue. So if I do it on the back of my hand, can I lift the skin off of the rest of my hand? If you can, if it comes up as kind of like a nugget or solid piece, that means there's fibrosis and fluid and skin changes so that instead of being all of your layers of your epidermis, your dermis, your subcutaneous fascia and all of that, it's all one segment now. So that lets us know the health of the area is not great and that you have lymphedema because no other condition will cause a positive stimmer sign. But if you don't have a stimmer sign, that doesn't mean you don't have lymphedema. You just don't have it progressed to the point that all the layers of the tissue have kind of joined together. If your healthcare professional, therapist, or physician have been trained to do internal uh, pelvic floor or rectal or vaginal assessments, you can actually check pitting, fibrosis, and skin mobility. You can't do a stimmer sign internally, but you can do the others to try to see, especially for females, do they have lymphedema in the vagina, but it hasn't progressed to the labias? And can I address it now before it gets to the labias, which is harder to address? If you had arm or leg swelling or lymphedema, your therapist is going to take measuring tapes and measure the arm or leg so many different places, put it on a um, piece of paper or in the computer, and they can make formulas out of it to tell you the exact volume of your arm or leg. Your genitals are not quite the same. So we can't do a true volume metric per se to say what is fully in that area. But what we can do is some girth measurements. The key with girth measurements is you have to pick areas that you can repeat. So finding those bony prominences that I showed you at the beginning, finding scars, birthmarks. Um, I often go from the belly button sometimes because it's not gonna move too much depending on their body type but you have to take measurements to show the involvement of the area and so that you can show progress over time or see if the patient is worsening if they come back after a long break. The pelvic floor muscles need to be assessed that not everyone can contract them, whether they don't know how they've never learned it or the damage from different surgeries or procedures have just made them so weak that they actually can't contract them. So we're going to need to work on those to get them stronger. So what is their ability to contract? Also, do they have resting tone? Are they tense? Because some of the positions that patients are put in for surgical procedures actually irritates these muscles the whole time. And because they're inside your pelvis, unless you're going to let me break your bones apart, I can't stretch them. No doctors ever let me do that. So we can't stretch the pelvic floor muscles by doing different yoga or other techniques so they can stay mad for years after a procedure. So is there tone with them? Is there pain with them? What are they doing and how are they impacting the patient in general, but also the lymphatic component? Some colleagues of mine developed a genital specific intake or quality of life tool that as I discussed before, a lot of the tools that are out there for arm, leg, head and neck and other stuff really don't address the genital region. And so when patients were filling them out, none of the questions applied and then it made them think, well, if what I have and feel is not on this sheet of paper, then I must be the only one. So this tool was developed, you can download it from the website to provide the clinician with actual questions that the patient answers to kind of help guide you that do they actually have genital swelling that you need to address? It helps the patient because this is in writing. Someone actually typed this out. And so if they've typed it and put it on a formal piece of paper, then obviously enough people have these symptoms that I'm not alone. 
I can talk about this because this person obviously knows this is something that I may have. So we found that patients were more likely to be open to talking and telling you before you had to really pull it out of them, what kind of symptoms or signs that they actually had. For those of us in the US that have to have a number for insurance, you can score this. So you can have the number for your quality of life section of your eval and progress notes to see how the patient is starting and how are they progressing. And again, it helps normalize it. So here's the tool for males. So you can see it has an area where they can actually draw out as opposed to most images that are on intake forms for therapy, the genitals have been removed. By having it on there, again, it normalizes it for the patient. And then you can see the different questions that really get into what's happening with the upper leg and genital regions, and they can grade it and that gives you your scores. And the same thing for the females. And it actually even gives a little bit more imaging because of how the labias can change, again, to let the females know that any of these are something we need to address. And this is how it could present because they may just think it's a part of aging because we do have natural changes that occur with the labias as we age. This may not be a normal change. This may be showing signs of lymphedema or abnormal tissue. So if you are a healthcare professional, I do recommend that you download these tools to using your toolbox. And if you are a patient, download these tools to take with you to your visits with your healthcare professionals. So they, again, have something that shows is quantifiable that they can show your symptoms and help you through it. So now that we've discussed signs and symptoms and how do we evaluate, how do we treat this? So complete decongestive therapy or complex decongestive therapy, this is what we do for patients with lymphedema, whether it's head and neck, arm, leg, wherever it is involved, all five of these components should be included in the lymphedema care. So we're going to go through each one of them. So first we're going to start with main lymphatic drainage. Um, often patients will call this a massage technique. Healthcare professionals, we don't typically like to call it massage because it is a very skilled manual procedure and often massages, especially by insurances, are considered an unskilled service sometimes. So just like you would address the leg, you go through standard manual lymphatic techniques, but you may want to add in some other nodes. The more nodes you can pull in to help with drainage, the better your outcomes can be especially if the patient has had involvement or damage to their pelvic nodes, we need to pull in other nodes to try to help take over. So SC is your supraclavicular nodes, which are right under your clavicle. Axillary is in your underarm. Your inguinal, those are the ones right in your groin. Your spinal nodes, you have nodes all along those lumbar nodes of your spinal column because obviously your body was built so that you don't end up with spinal cord damage from mild swelling in the spine. You have them in your sacrum or the bone that you feel in your buttocks. You have them between your ribs and you have some on in your back along the side called your quadratus lumborum. Breathing needs to be involved. I know a lot of times patients think the breathing is just something the therapist throws at them to keep them quiet and doing something while the therapist does something else, like wash their hands or get the room prepped. But breathing actually is very vital because what it does is it changes the pressure inside your thorax and your abdomen. Remember back to the anatomy pictures, you have vessels and nodes all along your pelvis and spinal cord region. So when you do your breathing, whether it's thoracic, which is using your upper trunk, diaphragmatic using your diaphragm or abdominal breaths where you're breathing lower into the belly, you're going to change that pressure system and you're going to help move or milk those uh, vessels and nodes to move fluid out of the way. You can add in muscle contractions. The recent studies on MLD show that it's more conducive or does better if the patient actually is moving during the manual lymphatic drainage, that they're not laying there either asleep or just telling you stories, but they're passive. The more active you are, obviously not interfering where the patient can actually, or the therapist can actually put their hands on you. But the more you do some contractions, even with isometric where you're not moving, 
the more the fluid moves out of the area. So making sure for genital involvement that you're including the Kegels or your pelvic floor muscles, and you're adding in your gluteals and your abdomen. So your transverse abdominis, rectus, um, and your obliques. There's three typical pathways that you can use for the genital region. Oops, went too far. So the most common one that's used, but often is the one that works the least, is going superior anteriorly. So what the third person is doing is they're cleaning the axillary nodes and they're bringing everything up the front of the trunk, across the chest, up the lower abdomen and bringing up over the mons pubis. The mons pubis already has brown adipose or fat tissue across it. And remember we talked about several slides ago that inflammation and adipose tissue feed off each other. So if you're bringing a lot of fluid over that brown adipose tissue, could you not be encouraging more lay down of adipose tissue, which will inhibit the flow even more? My favorite pathway is the inferior or posterior pathway, because you can see your lymphotomes there. You can see that the medial thigh, which is the lighter green kind of neonist, that is actually the lymphotome that your genitals are in. So you can bring it out the buttocks region and up into the lower back, and then it could go to your spinal nodes, your sacral nodes. You can still bring it up to the axillary nodes or even the quadratus lumborum nodes to try to help get it out of the region. But this one usually clears very well and it doesn't have the adipose tissue. There's more in your gluteal region, which is more um, superficial than where we're trying to get sometimes. You can also go laterally that I can clear the upper trunk, the lower trunk and the lateral thigh, then bring the fluid across the front of the thigh through the anterior leg and the medial lymphotome over and up. And again, I'm avoiding that mons pubis area. So you do need to make sure whether on any of the pathways that you are also cleaning the trunk. My key caveat is, and what often I find is not always done, is you have to address the trunk and the genital regions before or at least when you're addressing the leg. Then when we think of someone with breast cancer-related lymphedema, we don't start working on the arm until we've cleaned the trunk and the breast region. So you can't just clear the trunk and go straight to the leg and ignore the genitals because the genitals are at the top. So if I bring the fluid up, when that patient gets off my table and lays back down, the fluid's just going to fall into that genital region. So you must address the genitals. Compression. So there's several theories behind compression when we're talking about compression bandaging and garments that apply to how we apply it. The Starling's hypothesis, I'm not going to go into the great physics of it. I'm sure several clinicians out there have slightly rolled their eyes because Starling's is a very hard concept to understand sometimes. What you need to know is what Starling's is, is it's talking about the pressures between the blood, the tissues, and your lymphatics. So by applying compressure or compression, what we're doing is we're changing those pressure relationships to limit the amount of fluid coming out into the tissues and to increase the fluid leaving the tissues. So Starling's does apply, but it has some limitations because of how we have to apply pressure in that region. Another one is your law Laplace. That if you look at the picture there, most of the times your therapist, if you think about it, try to make your arm or leg into a cone because the law of Laplace is the pressure equals the tension or the amount that the therapist pulls, the number of layers divided by the radius of the region times the width of the bandage. So looking at this cross section, we'll say it's a leg, the lower ring has a smaller radius. And so you're going to feel more pressure with the same amount of tension as you do at the higher ring, which has a larger radius because of the law of Laplace. So can this apply to the genitals? To a portion, but we can't really make the genitals into a cone. So you're looking at a sphere or kind of an oblong shape instead. So the tension that we apply and the amount of pressure we put, or layers we put on, yes, 
but we don't really understand how width and radius apply yet. Another formula we use is Pascal's. What Pascal says, if you take any given spot on that cone and apply pressure, the pressure is equal at every spot at that area. So if you think of the leg, if I apply pressure on the anterior calf, the pressure is the same at that level on the side and the back of that calf. The reason that's important is if you have a wound somewhere or a very sensitive nerve, I have to keep in mind that if I apply pressure on the front part of the leg and your wound's on the back, that wound's getting that same pressure. So can that wound tolerate it? So yes, it does apply, but again, how, because how are you measuring like with a sphere, where are we talking about this exact same level? We also have contraindications and precautions to compressions for regular arms and legs. So do they apply to the genital? Is there other things we need to consider? One of the main ones is neuropathy or that your patient has to be able to communicate pain or discomfort because then they're not going to know that a sore is rubbing or that you've cut off blood supply and you're risking the body part uh, kind of dying off from no flow. So yes, it still applies, but it's going to be slightly different. These patients are not prone to neuropathy from chemo as your hands and feet are, but they may have it from spinal level involvement or nerve involvement. So if the patient can't communicate pain or discomfort, we need to be careful with compression. With arms and legs, we also have to consider arterial insufficiency. You may have heard the term an ABI, or an arterial brachial index, where they measure to see what is the blood amount coming down. So yes, we need to consider it, but typically an ABI is not done on the scrotum or the labia. So what does the clinician need to do to make sure you have proper blood flow? They may need to do capillary refill. With compression, we also have to consider urination and bowel movements. The patient has to go to the bathroom. When you go to the bathroom, you don't have to take off your arm sleeve. But if I've got to urinate and I have compression on the scrotal area, I may have to remove it to go to the bathroom. So we have to continue or consider that. For females, they may have a menstrual cycle that we have to figure out how are we going to incorporate pads or other components, or could they not tolerate it because of cramping? So we may need different levels of compression. With intimacy that males need to have garments that can adjust for growth and reduction of the size and do the garments or the compression that we're applying, would they cause pain if there was a significant change in size? And we need to make sure we're preventing infections, that this is a warm, moist environment, which microbes love. So is the garment or the compression or the bandaging that I'm using, is it making it warmer or more moist? Is it trapping stuff there versus wicking away? Is it going to increase that patient's chance of developing cellulitis or an infection? I wish I could tell you the magic uh, sauce for always getting compression right, but the genitals are probably one of the most tricky areas to put compression on because of the shape the uh, actions the patient needs to be able to do, they gotta be able to walk. So for bandaging, you've gotta find what will hold. What can you put on that will stay on? The patient or a caregiver has to be able to do it because again, the patient's gonna have to go to the bathroom. So they're gonna have to put it on and off themselves. They can't have it on and wait 24 hours till they see you again and not urinate. It also needs to support the genitals. Remember the tissue is very pliable and elastic. So you don't want it to stretch out because of the weight of the bandages and gravity pulling down on it. So you've got to make sure whatever you're doing, you're applying something, whether it's a jock strap or elastic shorts or something over the bandaging to help lift it back up for that patient. Garments, it's gotta be breathable. Typically your bandaging supplies are more breathable but your garments sometimes are not as breathable. So you've got to make sure it's the right material to be placing in the genital region. For garments, typically for daytime, your main goal is support and to prevent worsening with garments. You want to make sure that it is holding the genitals up so gravity is not pulling down on it and allowing more fluid to enter. And then your nighttime is usually the time that you get more reduction because you're, most of us do not sleep standing up. So gravity is not impacting you and you can get some drainage. So you may need two different types of garments 
so that you can address both the reduction component and the support component. <clears throat> Again, as with the MLD, you do need to make sure that you are addressing the genitals and the trunk if you're addressing the legs. If I put a thigh high stocking on a patient that has mild genital lymphedema and nothing on the trunk and the genitals, the fluid's going to come up the leg and can drop down into the genitals and take that mild genital involvement and make it more severe. With all lymphedema, there's skincare needs that we need to make sure we know, but there's extra ones that need to be added when you're talking about the genital region. Most of us do not like to do laundry. I don't like to fold laundry. But when you're talking about bathing, you do need to use a new washcloth or towel every time on the genital region. And really you should with any lymphatic involvement or use your hand and not a towel. Fragrances, whether it's lotions, soaps, or anything like that are not regulated by the FDA. So sometimes what the company puts in for fragrance and coloring can actually be an irritant in the genital area. So try to avoid the, what I call foo-foo smelling components because it could actually bother you. You don't want hot water for two reasons. One, it dries the skin out, dry skin's more prone to infection because of the cracking. And also heat increases fluid in the area. It causes your blood to come there. And so you could end up with more fluid. You want more tepid or warm. So I generally tell patients nothing hotter than you would put on a baby. Toilet paper sheds. So a good test is to wear black pants and wipe your toilet paper on your leg with the same pressure you wipe with and see what's left behind. Uh, the fragments of the toilet paper actually can be like fiberglass in that genital tissue and can cause more irritations. Hygiene products are expensive and I realize that, but they do need to be changed whether they're wet or dry every two to three hours. The reason why is because they're making contact with either the rectal and urinary systems or rectal, vaginal, and urinary systems. And all three systems have unique microbes or bacteria. What can happen is if you wear a pad consistently for extended period of time is you end up with microbes from one system entering into another system that's not used to having them and you can end up with C. diff in your bladder. If you do have an infection, meet with your physician. Don't just buy over-the-counter stuff until you know what the infection is and you know what works for your body because sometimes those over-counter things can actually cause that microbe to be resistant to other components and make things worse and turn it into cellulitis versus just a mild vaginal infection. Eating probiotics or yogurt or something to keep your good microbe count up is always beneficial. For intimacy, lubricants that water-based or olive oil are typically the best to use because they don't provide irritants to the genital region that your additives that they add in to make it warmer, to change the coloring and other components can be irritating to the genital tissue. You also want to use the restroom and clean after any amount of intimacy because there could be microbes from another person or sweat or dirt or other components that need to be cleaned out of the region. You need to speak with your healthcare professional to talk about sexual positions, that what positions will put the least pressure on your involved areas and will help keep gravity from making it worse. So working with trying to find what position is best. I encourage my patients to use either their partner or just themselves to do their manual lymphatic drainage pre and post intimacy. And this helps keep the fluid out of the area and so that it doesn't stay after the engorgement part is over but there has to be communication that you can't just assume the patients know these things. You need to talk about it. Exercises have to be included that typically with exercises, you want to sequence them no matter what body part it is, what we call proximal to distal. So we always start with trunk exercises. And then for genitals and legs, you would then start at the 
um, abdomen and the gluteals, the pelvic floor, then your thigh, then your knee, then your calf and ankle, because you want to clean the area that is proximal of fluid so that when you do a contraction distally, it has somewhere to go and move out. So sequencing your exercises can be done and you can work with your clinician to, I've had uh, athletes that, you know, they have to go to the weight room, they have to do these exercises, but you could sequence the workout in a gym to still be proximal to distal so that the patient is not worsening the condition by doing exercises out of sequence. And then home management. This is not a easy fix. It is something you will typically have for life and you have to do the home management that none of us, the first time our parents made us start brushing our teeth, we didn't want to stop playing with our friends, watching cartoons, coloring, whatever it was that was entertaining us. We didn't want to stop to go brush our teeth. But now most of us as adults, I hope if it's not true, please do not tell me. We don't really think about it at night in the mornings and whenever else we may do it of brushing our teeth. We just do it. So the same thing with CDT, make it a natural part of your day and you must do all aspects. Where I see the patients failing or not getting the results we want is where either the clinician or and or the patient are not doing all aspects. I'm not going to do the massage. I don't need the exercises. I only need to wear compression every now and then. You need to do all of it to get the best results and to keep the infections away. Weight does need to be addressed. I know it's a hot topic that can really cause emotional issues when discussed with patients, but if discussed in the right manner of not in a negative fashion, it's not the actual weight or the size, it's the adipose tissue and the pressure that it puts on the lymphatics. So what are some things you can do to minimize that and not stress just so much on diet? And you need to also talk about how age will impact the genitalia. How are things going to change as this patient ages so they then again know what is normal and what is not normal? So I know I've thrown a lot at you. So the key points is you need to know, understand, and be comfortable talking about this, whether you're the patient or the healthcare professional. It is just like a knee. It is a part of the anatomy that we shouldn't be embarrassed about, that we should talk about because it needs to be addressed. You can't assume someone else is addressing these issues that you need to make sure it is being addressed. You need to speak up about it and check it out if you're the clinician to really look at it. If you're at a loss, phone or email a colleague, colleague, do not just ignore the issue. It will not just go away because you didn't address it. So you need to make sure you are addressing it. Lastly, I want to apologize. My cat has Crohn's. And so today is not one of his good days with his intestines. So he has been making noises in the background. So I do apologize, but he is technically a pelvic floor issued cat. So I'm going to quickly just scoop through the references and then we'll go to the Q&A. Okay, I will see what's in the Q&A. If you have any other questions, please make sure you put it in there. So the first question I have is, what if a patient can't lay flat or in sideline for posterior MLD? So I have done it in multiple positions. I have done it where they sit on a stool or something that is uh, supportive enough so that that way they're not going to fall out of it and they can even put their arms up on the table and you can do it that direction. Um, you can do it at an angle. Um, I have done where they're kind of on a modified supine where they've got pillows and other stuff supporting. So my hands can get underneath them to clean it out. So you just have to be creative. What if your patient was pregnant? How would you as a therapist or a clinician move that patient to get to what you needed to get done without harming the baby? So just because it's genital, don't let your creative processes be stifled that try to think about how you could address it. Pumps. So there's been a lot of debate over pumps over the years and there's still no perfect answer. That remember that pumps are an adjunct. So if you're going to use pumps, you still have to use all five aspects of CDT. So that patient still has to do their full MLD of the entire area. 
of what they can at least reach. They still have to wear compression. They still have to do exercises, skin care, a home program. And then if they have an additional 45 minutes to an hour, they can add a pump. But the pump can't replace, especially for the genitals, the other components. And that's what I see happen too many times is I can lay on the couch with the pump on and watch TV or talk to people or do stuff on my computer versus if I'm having to do the exercises or the MLD that involves my hands and I can't do other stuff. So if you're using a correct pump that clears the trunk and you're doing all other aspects that I'm not against pumps, but if you're going to use it instead of or, or in place of other components, you're going to have issues develop. Surgical treatment for genital lymphedema. So the two main surgeries they will do is reductive surgeries where they cut out the involved tissues, or they've started recently doing the lymphovenous anastomosis or the LVAs. The LVAs in the genital region haven't been around long enough to really see uh, the total outcomes. Uh, from what I've seen for with my patients themselves, it's kind of 50-50. And a lot of that, again, goes back to compliance with the patient. One of my patients did none of his home program after surgery. So his symptoms came back even worse than they were prior to the surgery because he stopped all compression, all massage, everything else. My patients that do the best after surgery still stay with 100% compliance with their home program. With the reductive surgery, they're cutting out the tissues. They're not helping with the destruction or the damage that has occurred. And if you go into cert or studies that have a 10 to 15 year follow-up rate, most patients that had genital reductive surgeries have to have them again every five to eight years. So I find with my patients, if you start them early, you really work on the treatment and make sure you're changing the treatment to, if it's not working, change it. That don't keep doing the same thing if you're not seeing any progress change it up just like we would with an arm or a leg and try to prevent that patient from going to surgery because typically when they do, it's going to keep occurring. Male genitalia, it really depends on what's the best garments. Um, depends on the activity of the patient, the shape of the patient, the what's involved, what are their activity levels, what do they need to be able to do? There's no one best garment for any person or that fits everybody. Um, I find even like I have patients that are very slender, very active athletes that are young garments that work for my older patients with a little bit of a belly do not work for them because they don't have a belly. They need a different type of garment. So unfortunately I don't have a, everything fits all on that. Typically with the penis, if it's involved, you're going to have to wrap it with a foam type component, even with the garments, because you don't have garments that actually just isolate the penis. Um, do I do MLD each visit? Yes, I do MLD each visit. I do MLD directly on with gloves onto the genital region. Um, I am a pelvic floor therapist, so I also can do internal if it's warranted, but I do keep my patients modesty. I keep them covered as best I can and other stuff, but it's just like with the arm or the leg, you've got to address it. You've got to actually do the MLD for them and get them to do them at home. It's not just on us as the clinicians. Have I tried external catheter and wrapped around the penis? The issue with the external catheter is you have to be really careful because catheters are a gateway to infections. So like in a hospital system, they really have to document why are they using a catheter and trying to remove it every so often or justifying why it's staying in because the, we know that there is a significant increase in infection risk with the catheter. So no, I do not put catheters on my patients so that I can wrap them. I have had patients that have to do catheterization for other reasons that I work with them on that, but I do not use a catheter just so that I can wrap. Vaginismus can be a symptom of genital lymphedema. It doesn't mean if you have vaginismus, you have genital lymphedema, but vaginismus is kind of a catch-all term for irritation, inflammation, and pain in the vaginal area. So 
lymphedema can cause irritation, pain, and inflammation in the vaginal area. So a lot of the terms that are used in pelvic floor for pelvic pain diagnosis is could also apply to this because it all depended on who wrote that article or that book and how they named it. But all of your terms, vulvodynia, vaginismus, uh, pelvic pain, all of those can kind of uh, overlap each other. And when the scrotum's in hot water, it expands and in cold water, it contracts. Is one better than the other? You don't want extreme temperatures with lymphedema because your lymphatic system if it's extreme temperature, your lymphatic system actually just stops. If it gets too cold or too hot, your lymphatics is kind of like us. If I'm too cold or too hot, don't ask me to try to go do an activity outside or a clean house or something. I need to rest until my body temperature calms back down a little. So your lymphatic system actually just stops if it's too cold or too hot. Um, it also impacts your vascular system. If it's too hot, your vessels are going to run there for free heat and you're going to get engorgement of fluid. If you have lymphatic damage, that extra fluid may not be able to get back out correctly and may be stuck in the position or stuck in that region. And then cold water prevents the inf and the vascular from coming in as much as it vasoconstricts, and then you risk health of tissue and other components. So really sticking to more middle of the road temperatures and not extremes. <clears throat> Suggestion for a teenager with one side mild labia swelling. Um, she's in college. She needs to be doing exercises. She needs a garment that's going to address the trunk region. She needs to be doing MLD to address that aspect. I can't, without having seen the child, I can't give you actual pathways and other components, but she does need to get in with a therapist who can help her figure it out um, or contact someone like me and do video chats or something to try to figure something out. But it, I, without uh, seeing the person, I can't help with that. Who does surgery in Toronto? Um, I actually was asked earlier today where all the different surgeons are. So surgeons are like therapists. They do move around some, they do change. Are they doing the surgery or not doing the surgery? So there is no list that I am aware of at this point of all the surgeons and where they're located. What I can tell you is the best ways to find it is to reach out to CLTs or certified lymphedema therapists in your area that you're looking, and they can tell you who their patients are going to. You can also reach out to organizations like LEARN, uh, NLN, um, ILF, all these other different lymphatic organizations. They know where a lot of the physicians that help talk for them are located, that they can help put you in place with them. And Googling that I often, when I'm trying to find a person for my patients, I Google to find out where some of them may be, but there's not one currently, maybe learn, will do it for us. There's not one list that covers all the different surgeons in uh, different regions where they're located. So I'm not going to take that on myself, but if learn wants to do it, go ahead, do all of them. Um, so the quality of life thing, I, you can go to my company's website, uh, www.lymphed.com and it's on the genital page. You can click on and download it. Person with Crohn's 25. So we do know that, especially with primary, that there's a strong correlation between GI diseases and genital lymphedema. The reason why is your lymphatic system actually goes from your mouth all the way to your rectum, that your entire GI system is lined with um, malt, or mucosal assisted lymphoid tissue. So your tonsils, your payers patch, all of that is actually lymphatic tissue. So a lot of times, especially for peds that have this versus adult onset more so, there's an issue with the lymphatics is what's causing the GI component or the GI, whatever's causing it is also involving the lymphatics. And because of where the GI system dumps into, it's prone to get fluid into the genital region because of the dropping down components. So they do have a strong association between the two. There are so many compression garments, again, for females that it depends on what they're willing to wear. Um, I've had patients wear jock straps, wear postpartum garments, wear, uh, 
vulvar variscosity garments, biker shorts, bike cycling shorts, that there are so many different things out there. Again, it depends on the patient and what they need to do and their involvement that we need to address. If you, the patient has vaginal involvement and there is a uh, therapist or a physician that knows what they're doing and can teach, then yes, I do have patients do their own internal treatment with wands, but please do not go Google that and try to do it yourself because you could actually end up harming pelvic organs or tissues and you can't see it because it's internal. So do not treat yourself if you have not been taught how to do it with a physician or a therapist. Saunas go into heat. I wouldn't do saunas. Um, vibration plates can work, but again, you have to do the vibration with the MLD. Um, you also, with children, need to be careful with vibration plates because uh, high-level vibration plates, meaning they vibrate you at such a rate, has been known to cause uh, vision issues, especially in children. I don't recommend herbs. That is... Um, I encourage my patients to do their own research and talk with dietitians, but it is actually outside my practice act as a therapist to give you that you should take this specific herb. If your therapist or practitioner is not willing to do the MLD on your genitals, find another one. That that's like going to your dentist and he doesn't want to address your molars. He's only going to address your front teeth. Find another person that, um, some people just aren't comfortable with it. They haven't had courses on it. It wasn't taught to them. It's nothing against them, but you will need to make sure it is being addressed. You have to remember with physicians that there is only a very, 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 very small education on lymphatics during medical school that, um, I believe it was Roxon got the first question and it was around 2000 seven or 10 or something is when he told us at a conference was the first question on medical boards on the lymphatics. So it's not something that is taught um, significantly in medical school. I am at a medical school and I'm trying to change that within my own school, but they've got so much they have to cover that is going to be on boards. It's hard to add so much more when you're only going to look at one question on the boards. So again, the more you're educated by taking in pamphlets from different organizations, taking in the quality of life tool and doing your education or having therapists reach out to your physician to talk with them is how you spread the word. Where do you get garments for females genitals? I get them all over the place. I get my garments from different online companies. A lot of times I send my patients to the uh, less expensive stores just to try to see, um, how they like where things hit them. So do you want a high type girdle garment? Do you want a low one? Do you want something that comes down far on your thighs or not? So I'll send them to like TJ Maxx, uh, Walmart, other stores like that, just to try products to see fit wise what they would wear. And then we can get the proper compression from there. So uh, my search history that is very unique. And I always got in trouble at hospitals for where the sites I went to. So you have to just kind of keep looking. You can, again, always reach out to me, but I can't give you every garment that is out there and that I've used through my 22 years of this. Um, sitting makes me backflow and causes swelling. Yes. Cause when you are sitting, you are putting pressure on your, um, inguinal superficial and deep inguinal nodes, and that can block the swelling coming out of your leg. So being more lounged back, making sure your abdomen is not on your inguinal region. You can even be doing some self MLD to your nodes to try to help keep that flow going. Um, trampolines and reformers. Um, so the way trampoline and reformers work is if you think about it, when you're jumping, you have muscle contractions. So it's a type of exercise where you are getting contractions of most of your core and leg muscles, but you also have to weigh that against how coordinated and safe are you with trampolines and reformers? that if you can do it, it doesn't bother your vertigo or your ankles or things like that, and you enjoy it and it's working for you, then I'm okay with it. If the risk of you falling off the trampoline and breaking something's pretty high, 
I'm not okay with it. Or if you're seeing an increase in swelling, but again, the trampolines is part of your exercise component and doesn't take away from you still need to be doing MLD. You still need to be wearing compression and doing the other components of it. So I think I've gone through all of them. Um, if I missed one, again, I did give you my email address. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I will get back to you. I want to thank Learn again for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you about a topic that is so dear to my heart. Um, and the key things is you have to address it. And if it's not working, try something else that you can't just let it go. 